going to uh, Volume 5, Chapter 10, uh, looking at air operations. Um, this is either, we'll discuss both the uh, fixed wing concept of air med as well as the rotary wing um, with that. <laughs> Um, so we'll look at the pros, the cons, um, history when we look at it, and then we'll look at some different types of aircraft um, just very, very quickly. So um, again, the use of aircraft in um, EMS um, or in pre-hospital health is something that's you know relatively new. We're lo we're looking since approximately oh widespread use uh, again thanks to the military was about 1950 um, to 60 when we started looking at Korea War and then it expanded into Vietnam and then after Vietnam we started seeing this um, explosion into the domestic private sector uh, with that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that but also we'll talk about how treating of these patients in the air uh, versus on the ground has led to a higher or a, uh, a higher survival rate therefore a lower mortality rate um, of uh, traumatized patients as well as don't forget chronic patients um, you know a lot of people around here because the prevalence of um, specialized centers literally one per county or if you have a higher population uh, more in that population you do have to remember that there are some states and locations that are very austere if you go to North or South Dakota they have pretty much one hospital in the entire state and they're usually located around the highest population centers um, years ago, I learned that when I started researching what's called the uh, Lean Network, um, L -E -A, uh, Louisiana Emergency Access Network, L-E-A-N, when in the state of Louisiana, they have one level one trauma center, which is located in New Orleans, even Baton Rouge only had a level two. So they have um, down in that area, even access to EMS um, at the ALS level is limited. They have over 400 ambulance, 400 services throughout the state of Louisiana, but only four of them are ALS, one being New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and then the other one is uh, Acadian. Uh, but everything else is usually uh, BLS type in nature. And if you get out to some of those wayward areas where you can't get an ambulance in um, in a timely manner, you need a higher specialized care, um, that's when you end up going for either the helicopter or the fixed wing, depending on um, how far you need to go. Um, Scene responses, when we look at scene responses, we're looking at pretty much helicopter um, that may or may not be first on scene. Sometimes there are those cases. Uh, I'll talk about one specific situation um, back in 1994 where um, helicopter service was actually called in because EMS could not get into the scene until uh, later on in time. Um, or as a secondary response where ground personnel is on scene and they need extra assistance uh, or specialized care. And again, most of the time when it comes to rotary wing helicopters, it's going to be blood products, especially in the Commonwealth, Pennsylvania. A lot of inter-facility transports um, where somebody's on a balloon pump, somebody's on ECMO or something like that. Um, so they will transfer patients via, uh, via air. Um, it's just easier when it comes to that, even in city. Uh, um, in, in Pittsburgh, we have three level one trauma centers within five ground miles of each other around the point and uh, Mercy Hospital, UPMC, Presbyterian, as well as McGee and Shadyside and West Penn are all within three miles of each other, but because of various um, um, specialization, they will actually transfer, utilize a helicopter to literally go two miles. Um, you know, we see that um, especially in the New York area, um, just for transportation. They'll just call a helicopter in uh, from one building to another because of the traffic. Um, so that's something to be, uh, you know, think about if you end up going elsewhere um, for your practice, um, knowing what the local si uh, policies and procedures are when you utilize helicopters and or um, fixed wing aircraft. But again, whatever you're gonna end up using, it's gonna be based on distances to be traveled and patient's condition as well as, um, can you land something here versus land something there? Those are something to uh, think about. Now, air transport is something that is um, 
highly uh, lucrative for individuals to get into it. Um, you will find out that a lot of the private services, if you've been following anything with Medicare, Medicaid, and surprise billing, uh, a lot of the for-profit services um, are charging about yeah, anywhere between twenty to thirty thousand dollars for air transport um, when it comes to the helicopter. Um, for the nonprofit agencies, um, when I used to do billing for um, Air Medical um, out of Pittsburgh and look at their charts, they were averaging about five to six thousand dollars per scene run. Uh, but that those were non nonprofits versus uh, for profit. Now uh, with that, now when we start talking about um, helicopters, okay, these are also known as rotor rotary. Um, aircraft, um, their, their distances are usually 150 to 200 miles. And you could Google any time and see, and because they'll get, they could show you a topography map that will show you how far different aircraft can cover. Um, all of my experience in, in, uh, in, in the rotary wing is based out of Western Pennsylvania. Um, I can tell you all about the progression of your protocol um, when it comes to utilization of that and, um, you know, calling a helicopter and, you know, transportation um, with that there's a there's a long wonderful story that goes along with that that I won't bore you with um, and then what we also look at is the specialty cares we do have specialty teams um, especially when it comes to the neonate um, as well as organ procurement um, most of the time when we do organ procurement it one of the jobs if you get your uh, once you get your medic if you want to that actually pays very lucratively is becoming part of an organ procurement team. Uh, Western Pennsylvania has um, one of those agencies. It's called CORE, the Center for Organ Recovery and Education. And, um, you know, I can tell you 20 years ago, they were paying medics close to 60000 a year to come in and be an organ procurement coordinator where you were on call for 72 hours at a time. You had to go at the drop of a hat, go pick up the transplant team, get on a fixed wing aircraft um, from the county airport. You would then fly out, pick up the um, organ, fly it back, usually within a four hour flight radius, but that also depended upon the organ you were going to get, um, bring it back, drive them to the facility where they would then transfer that over to the transplant team, and then you would take the team back to your base. Um, that was, like I said, that was almost 20 years ago, and that was 60K a year back then. And that was just with my medic. Um, so um, a lot of people um, do like that job. Um, you get to fly all over the country. But um, um, but again, it comes down to the type of transport that you need. So here you can see specifically in a uh, aircraft, here you have an isolate with a child being transported uh, to facility. You know, perhaps this child was born um, early, premature. Um, at a local um, outlying facility that doesn't have neonate care. They need to transport them specialty care. So you call the um, pediatric team and they come in from the specialty children's hospital, provide their team and their equipment and they transplant, uh, transport as needed. So that's something to think about. Um, but the one experience that I had using um, a rotary wing aircraft to be a primary um, search and rescue or um, um, needs-based assessment for us um, was back on September 8th of 1994. Um, Flight 427, which was a Boeing 737-3 um, flying in between uh, Chicago to Pittsburgh and then final destination of being West Palm Beach, um, crashed on final approach to um, Pittsburgh International Airport. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason why I say the aircraft was very important to us, now in Western Pennsylvania, we have two primary services, Stat Medivac, uh, which you guys may have heard out in this area. They do have a base in Maryland, D.C., as well as York. Uh, but we also have um, Life Flight based out of Allegheny General Hospital. And Life Flight was one of the primary um, initial helicopter services in the Commonwealth beginning in the 1970s. But um, because um, because of Life Flight and Stats' um, specific um, um, abilities to fly low, to hover, as well as to have the spotlights, the infrared uh, radar, as well as night vision goggles, um, they were able to fly over the crash scene. Here you can see this picture um, taken, obviously, the next day if not the third day after everything had done um, smol um, smoldering, um, Life Flight and Stat were able to fly over the scene, which 
Um, the aircraft was on final approach approximately four to uh, four to four and a half miles away from uh, runway uh, 28 right. Um, they were following behind a Delta airline um, crash and basically what had occurred to this aircraft while on final approach from about 10,000 feet up. Um, they had gotten a microburst. They believed it was uh, left over from the plane in front of it, which was four and a half miles away, um, had caused them to um, rotate around um, their long axis, which caused them to become inverted. Now, when this became inverted, um, the normal reaction for the pilot is pull up on the stick. Well, the problem was when they pulled up on the stick, that meant that they were inverted going down. At the same time, the um, the um, um, second officer proceeded to give it full throttle. Well, at this point, you didn't know because they were on IFR um, instrument flight regulations. They inverted, they full throttled, and they estimated that the aircraft made that crater um, at about six to 700 knots. And they buried it in the ground with all 132 souls um, dying in that. Um, I was on duty that night with a secondary service that was about 15, 20 miles um, to, the, um, to the east of the airport. Uh, we were all activated um, to come in and uh, we were standing by um, to that until Life Flight and Stat flew around and said there was no way um, that um, crews could get into that, that th those access roads weren't found because this occurred at about seven o'clock at night in September. So um, it was pretty much getting dark by that point. Um, and we could not access the scene until several hours later. Um, the crash actually occurred in Beaver County. Um, Pittsburgh International Airport is located in the western uh, geographical location of Allegheny County that sits on the corner of uh, Beaver County. And you actually fly in over Beaver County from the north to the south. Uh, but that was the first time I had ever we had ever used or it had heard of using a helicopter to give us um, scene issues. Nowadays, we would be doing this with drones, um, but um, it's it's one of those uh, career um, defining moments um, with uh, you know having a massive um, you know uh, commercial airline uh, flights uh, crashing in your service area. Um, this also had um, you know personal. Um, issues for me um, because I used to be an aircraft mechanic, an avionics technician. I had kind of, you know, grown up around the airport um, learning my trade at that time. So um, this was something that, you know, on both ends, being a medic as well as still having my uh, certifications at that time, I was quite uh, interested in it as well as um, we, we never went in that day. Um, to do that, but we knew about, it was a body recovery. And I ended up going in at about on the fifth day um, and uh, ended up uh, doing, um, I don't even wanna say body recovery because the largest portion of um, tissue I picked up on was about the size of a uh, pinky nail. So, uh, but again, that's, you know, 20, plus years ago with that. But again, here you can see this this um, this pilot here, or this may be a crew member, um, four bars, that's a captain. So he's a pilot, but Austin Travis um, Center here, these are night vision goggles. That's why it's very important if you have to set up a landing zone or anything else like that, you gotta be mindful at night that you don't shine anything directly from the co into the cockpit, because if somebody's wearing these, you're gonna blind them. Um, if you do have a search and rescue mission going on and it is in the evening or even during the daylight, perhaps a medical helicopter is not your um, is not your cup of tea just for the fact that they don't have some highly specific search and rescue material. This is the uh, state uh, PSP air division and all of these devices have those lights as well as they have downward looking infrared. Uh, these guys could see uh, infrared um, signal in the uh, in the dark much much better than a, a medical helicopter can just based on their specific um, um, technology that they have in their um, aircraft all right those bells um, 
with that. They can also help with disaster assistance, again, getting things in and out. We're starting to see a lot of the smaller stuff being replaced by drones. Um, but again, it's one of those things that um, if something is not accessible by ground, um, they can call in the helicopter, whether it be a rotary wing or a fixed wing. Uh, we see a lot of this uh, fixed winged, especially up when you start getting into um, Alaska. I do know they do, there's a, a big service that runs between Seattle, Vancouver, and uh, Alaska, especially during the winter months. Um, but again, one of the things the side effect, the, the, one of the side things you got to be worried about is it has to be used responsibly. Um, it is costly, but again, offers various advantage over ground transport. One is blood, and two is because of the staffing levels between uh, in Pennsylvania, PHRN. Perhaps there's a physician. Uh, they do have the capability of RSI, and one of that one of those reasons behind it is because of the actual size of the area that you're working at. You know, in an ambulance, we do have a small limited size, but cut that down by about half and you're at 3,000 feet. You can't pull over if your patient gets uh, combative on you, all right? Um, and then the protocols. But again, we've already talked about that air transport is tied in with the military. All right, first recorded uh, use of an airplane to evacuate evacuate individuals was in World War I. Um, and then during that time, the air, um, uh, air ambulance operation used by the French and British uh, were during the African and Middle Eastern colonial war wars of the 1920s to be able um, to get the individuals up uh, from the field of battle. The idea of triage, get them out from the field of battle and get them uh, closer to the um, definitive care. Uh, and that's where that all started. The first successful operational helicopter um, in the U.S. was in approximately 1942. It was a Sikorsky YR-4. Um, and then we ended up seeing further um, with the increase of technology and the use of the rotary wing aircraft. We see Burma and then in 1950, again, where we see this massive use during the Korean conflict, um, North and South Korea. Um, and if you ever watch MASH, I have a picture of that later, one of those older helicopters. It was not about treating the patients. It was stabilizing them, throwing them on outriggers, um, strapping them down, putting something to cover their head and face, and then flying them to the local heli flying them somewhere to where they could get care. Uh, nowadays with our helicopters, we actually provide care in the aircraft. Um, when we get to the 1960s in Vietnam, we start seeing the introduction of the uh, larger uh, Sikorskis, the Hueys, um, and then we start uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Marine UH-34s, um, and then we start getting um, further and further and further, um, repurposing user using technology, uh, twin turbos, um, turbine engines, and all that other stuff. Um, and then we start seeing a lot more um, with Australia and the Europeans uh, using helicopters more and more. Uh, but basically what we find kind of figured out was we can get individuals like in those faraway rural areas, those austere areas, we can get them to the desired care much quicker as we move along. Um, domestically, in 47, Schaefer Ambulance um, in the United States was the first air ambulance service in the United States. And because in that time, it was, uh, we didn't have any state um, certifications that went along with it. So aircraft started being um, um, checked and accredited under the FAA um, at that time. And then back in 1970, 70 to 74, 75 under the uh, Nixon uh, Ford era, that's when they started uh, passing legislation. And that first legislation that they started to uh, pass was called the uh, MAST, the Military Assistance to Safety and Traffic. Started looking at stuff under NHTSA, but again, this was all still primarily militarily driven. And then at that same time, we start seeing uh, the Maryland State Police Program kicking in, um, which still runs today, and it's one of the oldest um, helicopter services in in the country and 72 Denver um, put their flight for life into um, into uh, service in 2001 they uh, Medicare started a reimbursement for um, helicopter ambulance uh, transport allowing overall growth in community-based, the non-hospital sector. And in 2010, there were 733 hospital bases with a total of 900 aircraft. 
Um, and then in 2015, the FAA determined the term helicopter EMS, HEMS, now be called HAA, Helicopter Air Ambulance is now used. And because the helicopters are covered under the FAA, um, the state certifies them, but it becomes a billing issue. Um, you know, who can bill it um, under the deregulation of the aircraft industry? That's where the, um, the FAA all comes in. So again, we've already talked about the rotor wing. Um, those are the helicopters. Um, vertical takeoff um, usually only fly up to about three to 4,000 feet. Um, they are non-pressurized cabins, but when we start getting into fixed wing aircraft, they need a landing field, um, long field, depending on what their environment is as well, um, as well as typically your fixed wing have pressurized cabins because they fly above 10,000 feet. Uh, but each one of these all have to have basic needs. Their state um, sets up what they need, um, you, know, um, you know, oxygen, liquid oxygen, pressurized oxygen systems. But again, we'll take a look at a couple of the pictures of the, um, the care areas, and you'll see that they're much, much smaller as well as fixed wing as well as uh, rotary wing do have um, requirements for height and weight for the providers. All right, uh, fixed wing aircraft, they're easy. They're the, they're the um, airplanes, all right. Um, they land on uh, landing um, airways. They're governed by air traffic controls. Uh, you just can't call them in for um, a scene run. Um, typically these uh, fixed wings are used for um, long-term, um, Long distance transports, they could fly up to, you know, 400, 500 miles an hour, um, much more comfortable, fly above, uh, they can fly above weather patterns, but they do require uh, pressurized cabins. Um, a turbine engine or piston engine, some of them are actually covered under turboprops, all right? Um, but when we do that uh, with turboprops, um, um, they're, they're more fuel efficient, but it costs a lot. Um, usually Jet A is running about 10 bucks a gallon um, for those. Um, so uh, most air ambulances are turbine, have at least two engines. Um, you got to have dual uh, um, services with a dual engine aircraft. Um, basically, if one goes out, you always have a secondary or re redundant uh, systems. Um, pressurized cabins. Allow safe, comfortable travel at altitudes, you know, and again, fly above any weather, weather patterns. And they are usually larger than helicopters. Most of the time, though, some of the smaller ones um, usually only transport one at a time with two crew members. Some may only have one crew member, um, but um, typically you'll have one pilot and maybe a co-pilot in that. Um, so a couple things that you uh, need to be aware of. Um, and they're always looking for individuals to fly. But again, they do have weight and height restrictions. Uh, for the fixed wings, it's more of a weight issue, uh, not a height issue. Most of the time, the maximum that you could be um, to fly is going to be about uh, 220 pounds uh, because of all the equipment usage and everything else like that. There's a thing known as center of gravity that pilots must be aware of. Um, you know, where's the weight going to be in the fuselage? It does affect the flying characteristics as well as weight. <clears throat> Most airports, because it has to require people to take on and off, they're not in close proximity to a patient or, or a hospital. Most of the time what happens is these are, are scheduled ahead of time. You have a ground ambulance critical care team, which will um, take care of the um, drive to the landing area for the aircraft, pick up the crew and their equipment, drive them to the transporting facility, uh, pick them up, drive the crew and the patient back to the hospital, uh, back to the uh, landing zone. They then get on the airplane. They then fly to the um, facility uh, destination. Another ambulance crew is there to help um, load and offload, take them to the facility and, and bring the crew back to the ambulance. So there is ground transportation that still is required um, with that, but it is a time consuming process. And these are typically, unless it's an organ recovery or something like that, these are usually um, time prohibitive in the fact that they have to be scheduled. Here you can see a turboprop engine. Um, this is in um, Australia. 
This is run by the New South Wales Ambulance Service. It is a government operated uh, facility, but you can see they got a couple different aircraft um, in that. Um, but again, remember, you know, um, Australia is about as wide as the United States. So if you are in Perth or if you're in Sydney or something like that and got to go east, to, east coast to west coast, um, an ambulance would take, you know, three days to get across the country. This can be done in less than six to eight hours. Here you can see various types of aircraft. Um, here you can see this is a jet, flies higher, can fly faster, um, you know, six, 700 miles an hour, whereas the turboprop is gonna go four to 500. Okay, not as high altitude, uh, but uh, can, you know, get the same thing accomplished. Here you can see the inside of one of these aircraft. Here is the cockpit up front separated. Here you can see here's the same thing. This has a space for two individuals. Here's where the patient goes. Um, small, small cramped quarters. This is a very narrow uh, fuselage. Um, and then here you can see down here um, at the bottom, here's a uh, transport from the facility to or from, and they're putting the patient in to the aircraft and placing them in there and hooking them up where they need to go. Up here in the upper right-hand corner, um, this is a uh, military uh, C-130 that has been modified to be a patient transport. Um, the military uh, logistics and everything else, uh, they are one wonderful for transporting. But again, here you can see these are limited one to two people. But here are the C-130, here you can see they're stacked four high, plus they have individuals on the side, as well as they can be set up and broken down to be literally flying operating rooms uh, in ICU beds and, and everything else like that. So uh, the air medical transport side of the Air Force are wonderful individuals. And again, they're able to take all of this technology and transport it in and out um, to wherever people need to be. Rotor wings, um, helicopters, the whirlybirds, um, they provide lift by having a helicopter um, spin, um, have the motor spin um, in a rotational fashion that will allow lift to occur vertically, uh, whereas on a fixed wing aircraft, you have to have air coming across at a high speed across the um, camber of the wing, which provides lift. So you have to be moving forward, but with a rotary aircraft and spinning of that allows you to go vertically. Um, most aircraft have a rotor, a single main rotor, anywhere between four to five to six main blades. And then they end up having a tail rotor that will counteract what's called the gyroscopic effect of that aircraft twisting, following along its normal um, rotation. Um, most of the time they are powered by a uh, turbine jet engine. The smaller ones have a single engine. Um, the mo bigger ones, and we'll see a picture here of a Sikorsky um, that um, Lifeline flies. Those are dual, a um, lot more safety redundance, but again, um, more engines, more, um, more service that goes into them. Um, they usually do fly single pilot um, on these. Um, most of them fly VFR, visual flight rule, which means they can only fly during the day as well as they have to have clear skies and a um, up to about three to 5,000 feet. Um, but under instrument flight rules, that means with IFR, they're able to fly at night and into moderate weather. Um, with um, nighttime vision and all that other stuff. Um, there's a whole list of other things. You have to be VFR before you're IFR, um, and the pilots have to have so many hours. Uh, regardless, please remember that you can call and request a aircraft, but it is up to the pilot to make that determination after a weather check, whether or not that individual is able to fly or not. And it is the pilot, it doesn't matter. They don't even tell the pilot about the severity of the patient. Um, that way they don't um, integrate any bias in it. Most pilots will determine whether or not for the safety of their, their, their crew and their aircraft on whether or not to fly with that. And again, depending on where you're flying, you know, it's going to vary with terrain, late day or night, whether they're VFR or IFR, as well as their overall distance from the home base. Um, and again, please realize, you know, Coming from Western Pennsylvania, I will tell you, um, having dueling services, different pilots will have different criteria in which they will and or will not fly, as well as having multiple bases. Because if there's a weather front coming in from, let's say, the south, and your southern bases are blocked in, secondary to weather, 
your northern bases may be able to fly and come back in. Um, so it's really, really interesting to see who's going to fly and who's not going to fly, um, as well as their overall capabilities and what aircraft um, that goes along will that. Um, please realize that all helicopters um, in, in that we're talking about now, whether they're VFR or IFR, have to follow what's called the ATC system, which is the air traffic controller system. They have to have um, clearance from local air traffic control to know that they're flying into a restricted airspace or something like that. Um, uh, in Pittsburgh, where you do have a large metropolitan um, airport, um, as well as much, much smaller airports, you have to, you have to be, uh, the pilots have to be aware, as well as air traffic control has to know what's flying in and out of various airspace. All right. Um, landing somebody because of that, you know, um, calling in a scene run or something like that, um, as a ground transport unit, please realize that, um, you know, having a designated landing zone is a heck of a lot better than just saying, oh, let's go land in, you know, the cow paddy field. Um, or let's go land them at the corner of the four points of the, you know, the two main roads. Or let's land them on, you know, I-79 during rush hour and have state police get all ticked off at you because you shut down north and southbound, um, um, you know, traffic way. Uh, so it, a lot of different things will come into whether or not an aircraft will come in um, uh, into an LZ. Um, I have had the... Um, luxury of working with both services um, with some uh, war, um, Vietnam era pilots um, that were crazy. Um, I, I, I can't say it any better. These people, would, these guys and girls would fly into any situation. They're like, nobody's shooting at us. It's not going to hurt us. So let's bring it in. Um, so, um, you know, becoming familiar with your own policies and procedures, knowing where you're at in your service area, um, please realize calling in an aircraft, they're going to sit on scene for 25, 35 minutes. Maybe that 25, 35 minutes, you could already be at the facility. Um, but again, um, you know, calling in an aircraft and um, especially, you know, multiple multiple um, MCIs, anything else like that, you will always, ha always have individuals that will play Monday morning quarterback. Did you need to do it? Um, did you need um, assistance? Did you need an airway assistance? Did you need blood or anything else like that? Or was it something, you know, traffic or anything else like that? Unfortunately, what you will find if you do live in an area, um, as I did for many years, um, the coolness factor of calling in an aircraft, as well as the basic laziness of calling in an aircraft uh, because the crew didn't want to transport the 35 minutes to the level one trauma center, um, you know, um, it w was very uh, big. And what we saw with that was the overabundance, especially in my service areas where I used to run um, for many years in the early 2000s. Um, everybody would call um, just because it was cool. And there were um, the two helicopter services um, practice business because it is a business. And they went around to all the local fire departments. Uh, there was one helicopter service that said, if you land my helicopter, whether we transport a patient or not, we'll give your department a $500 um, landing fee. So that became an issue because we would get local fire departments get on scene of a fender bender or something like that. And next thing you know, they've got a helicopter inbound um, and no medical crews have actually um, assessed the patient. Um, now I'm all in favor of calling in resources early um, because it will take time, about 20, 25 minutes for an aircraft to decide whether or not they're going to fly. Uh, but if they're in the air, they can just turn around and, and uh, reallocate those resources. Um, but when you but when you find out that, you know, business model was 500 bucks per LZ, it was, uh, it, it, it's qu uh, quite interesting um, with that. All right. Helicopters and air ambulance is not limited to airport as point of takeoff or landing. Uh, there are some rules. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, approaching the aircraft, what do they need? Um, you know, any, any distractions, any tall things, whether they be telephone poles or anything else like that. Um, and again, they can pretty much land almost anywhere. I don't recommend landing in a uh, farm field um, in the middle of March. 
uh, when there's still slight perma, uh, slight frost, uh, but it had rained and the um, farmer had just uh, fertilized the field and there were cow patties everywhere. When the helicopter landed and took off, they literally were throwing pieces of um, fertilizer everywhere. Um, not the best thing, but here you can see here, Austin Travis, um, area down here, EMS Fire Rescue. They've got these nice little uh, five, um, um, five bladed uh, rotary aircraft with a tail rotor. Okay, uh, this is a county run system. So this is a non-commercial use for emer probably emergencies only. Um, but again, um, everybody's going to have a different take on make and model and um, technology and everything that goes along with it. Here you can see Coast Guard Sikorsky. Um, these are heavy, heavy bladed um, aircraft. You hear these things coming. Uh, but again, this is a Coast Guard system. If you ever start to work down and around uh, points of entry or something like that, you may end up getting one of these uh, bad boys coming in um, to you. They are a sight to see come in. Um, and if I can find my old pictures, uh, videos, we did have three helicopters land at the PA College a couple of years ago, uh, but due to the cost of um, cost of fuel, we're unable to do that because there are uh, not that many um, helicopter services that will actually do um, LZ setups for us anymore for training. Uh, but at that time, we, have Jet, we had Jeff Stat, Lifeline, and I think I had two, uh, I don't know if I had Life Flight coming in. At that, but I'll see if I can uh, find those uh, and I'll post them up for you. But here you can see a bunch of different aircraft, just like ambulance services. Uh, everybody's got their own little color scheme. Everybody has their um, needs and wants and specs on their device. Um, I put these two here, Stat Medevac. This is the picture. This is the picture off of uh, UPMC Presbyterian's um, LZ. Um, off their main area. Here you can see this is Cathedral Learning at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, but they, this is up on the um, 11th floor from STATCOM. Um, they come in and at the time this was a combined pad um, at UPMC Presby for Children's Hospital as well as for uh, UPMC Presby Level 1 Adult Trauma Center and the Level 1 Children's Hospital uh, Trauma Center. Um, the um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh has been moved about five miles into Lawrenceville um, about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. So um, this is just taking adult. Here you can see Geisinger Life Flight out of Danville, um, as well as out east. Um, but again, helicopters are going to be very specific to the um, um, service in which they fly, different color scheme, everything else like that. Now, all of these aircraft here are um, required to have um, FAA numbers. Here you can see um, N484LF. I didn't get that one in here. Here you can see this one is N139TJ, Thomas Jefferson. This is Life Flight. Here you can see, I don't know what that tail number is. Um, N611LL, which stands for Lifeline. Um, but even though these are all FAA and the tail numbers um, approximate the, um, um, tell you what the um, unit number is according to the FAA, all of these aircraft also have to be cleared and um, checked off by, um, in these cases, since these ones here in Pennsylvania um, are all required to be Pennsylvania Bureau of EMS uh, approved. Um, as, when I worked for the state EMSI, my job was to oversee, because Allegheny County was my um, counties of um, oversight, I did um, have to check um, stat and life flight. Each one uses a different idea. Notice these are not required. Prior to 2005, each helicopter service in the Commonwealth used to require, the state used to require that they put the seal on the side, but traveling at two to 300 miles an hour, um, as these aircraft do, they would rip off very easily. So what they would do is put them in a um, pocket protector and put them under the um, Put them under the uh, pilot seat um, as far as the bureau, but each unit has to be checked off, carry the appropriate amount of material, and have all of the checks, just like an ambulance does. Except we don't have um, these aircraft do not have exterior components um, or areas where you can put something outside. If they do, you can't access it during flight. So everything has to be mobile and they have to be put in pack. That's why you'll see various uh, services will have various types of Thomas packs, stat packs and whatnot um, to go along with this. Most of these aircraft do not have pressurized oxygen um, in the typical cylinders. They have what is known as liquid oxygen. Um, they're small little canisters look like a compressor that fit there and they off gas that for the oxygen. Um, 
each one of these aircraft have different uh, flight characteristics, um, you know, different ceilings that they can reach, different um, speeds in which they can have. You can notice here, um, if you look at the uh, Geisinger life flight up here, the blue and red one, they have an open tail rotor. If you look at the STAT, the Jeff STAT, as well as the Lifeline, Lifeline is a beautiful aircraft. It's a Dauphine, um, much longer um, um, distance and speed. These probably go 400, 450 miles an hour, but they have the enclosed um tail rotor. This stops the aircraft from going around. Here you can see the Maryland State Police have an open rotor. Now there's another system I'll show you here in a minute. Here it's called the NOTAR system, no tail rotor, where instead of using a actual gyroscopic effect of a fan um, going the opposite direction of the main rotor, what they have is a vacuum. Uh, they take the exhaust from the turbine engine and they blow it out of the side. Um, pretty cool system. But again, each one of these has, have, um, based on the state and the scope of practice of who flies, when and where, um, they have different types of um, um, areas that they could fly to speeds and all that, uh, different types of characteristics. Um, and again, this all came out of these military style aircraft. Here you can see here in the 1970s, here you have your typical heavy Huey. Uh, these could carry two patients into them. These uh, were also troop carriers on the way in without patients. Um, but if you ever watch the movie, um, say, uh, not Saving Private Ryan, um, but if you ever watched um, We Were Soldiers, um, as well as uh, Full Metal Jacket, you'll see these have these were two to three bladed aircraft. The older ones were two bladed, uh, single turbine engine, big engine failure issues on these things. But um, what you'll end up seeing is the bigger um, the aircraft and the lower number of rotors, the length, the length of the rotor has a lot to do with how much weight they can carry. But these guys, you'd hear these things coming two, three, four miles out, and they'd have that real heavy whoop, 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 whoop sound to it. Um, here you can see a Sikorsky. These, these are up here in the upper left-hand corner. This is Afghanistan. Um, here you can see these guys, um, uh, four-bladed system. Um, but again, these guys were heavy lifters. These are carry, I believe, four. Um, but again, um, these are much, much heavier um, systems, bigger systems. Here you can see this Blackhawk over here. Again, over here at the Air Force, they're using the same uh, platform pretty much. I think this one's a Sikorsky, um, but these are for PJs. The Air, Air Force has um, PJs, uh, para-jumpers. Um, these individuals will be um, austere medicine. They're all medics. Um, uh, and they get dropped down into austere environments and take care of the injured. Uh, but out of all of these, the ones that have the biggest um, biggest take care of these um, double tandem, um, in my um, these are oh geez, I just forgot the name of them. They're called Chinooks, S C H N O O K S. Um, these guys don't have uh, twin rotors. These guys don't have tail rotors. Um, they end up working off a dual gyroscopic effect where they have intermeshing main rotors. Where this front um, blade system goes clockwise. This one here goes counterclockwise. They are connected twin turbine. They have a long. Um, and they end up having a long drive shaft together. Um, these guys are just wonderful, wonderful aircraft. Um, I, my my C series um, dissertation for my graduation when I went to aircraft school was on the theory of flight for um, rotor wing aircraft. Um, but here you can see this famous picture of this Chinook crew um, because they, their distance was much, much greater. They had to get fly much, much higher into the um, LZ, into the Afghan uh, mountains. This, this pilot ended up landing the aft section on the roof of this mud hut to load up the uh, injured into that area. Um, that's just awesome, just for the fact that you have that much control of that. But again, this flies much faster. This um, has a much further distance, uh, as well as a higher ceiling, thanks to the different types of rotors that they're able to get. Historically, when we look at that, here's the um, MU-34. Um, this is the Marine version of this. Here you can see single pilot, 
elevated away closer to the rotor system. Uh, but again, the treatment was back here into the fuselage. And here you can see if you've ever watched um, the show MASH, uh, of the MASH 4077 back in the Vietnam era, um, they couldn't transport the patient inside. If they were unconscious, they would just strap them to these outriggers that were put on their skids, uh, strap them down very uh, tightly. There was no airway. There was no way to monitor them. They would just put a bubble over their head, shoulders, and mid-thorax and take off. Um, this helicopter was capable of carrying a maximum of three. Um, very small engine. This would probably be comparable to maybe a Honda Civic engine at that point, probably. 200cc displacement. Uh, but when we look at this, again, three, one seated here and then two on either side. It was all always important to keep your center of balance. So if you only had one individual, they ended up having a mannequin, approximately 180 pound mannequin that they could fly out that way, the center of gravity, because if not, this would list one side or the other. And again, this system has evolved over the past 40 years. In 01, the, the government under um, HHS changed the reimbursement scheme, um, which resulted in significant increase. They deregulated the system. And again, that's where we start getting these for-profit entities, entities charging $35,000 for a uh, helicopter transport. Um, there's the community-based model, which are typically your nonprofits that are owned by hospital systems, but also you end up having the uh, for-profit model. Um, and again, this initial treatment for the domestic care is for the trauma care. Um, later on, we get into stroke care, we get into cardiac care and everything else like that. But also it then expanded from the scene runs to the interfacility transports, as I said earlier, balloon pump, stroke, surgery, airway issues, all that stuff that we go along. It does provide an efficient um, and effective timely method of moving patients. But again, it's costly in that. Um, and from the scene run, we started to expand, and, and you'll read this as you, you've read this already, and you've heard the term golden hour or the platinum 10 minutes, which actually has no scientific um, scientific basis. People just tied onto that, but it does if you're out somewhere, mass casualty incident, you can't get in, you can't get out. You've got a you know an hour transport versus 15 traveling at 200 miles an hour or something like that. You know the the ways and benefits, pros and cons of calling in a helicopter for a scene run are really dependent on the clinician that's doing it. Um, because um, patient needs care specialized center does not mean patient must be transported by hel helicopter or airplane. Again, it's a clinical decision. Uh, patients that are in traumatic cardiac arrest or patients generally now that are in cardiac arrest are not warranted by using a helicopter um, at this time. Please remember, you know, and I'll show you a couple pictures here. When you get into the back of these aircraft, it's half the size of what we have in the back of our um, larger Mickey units or our um, larger emergency vehicles. Um, if, imagine trying to work in a rest with, in a sprinter um, style ambulance, van type ambulance, only decrease your ceiling by half. Um, as well as your patient, you may not have access to your entire patient because they may be included in the fuselage or up near your uh, pilot. Um, now I will tell you, you know, I, I, I have personally, I have transported, uh, one call comes to mind where I did transport a uh, patient in cardiac arrest. Um, I was in the middle of nowhere. I was 45 minutes from any receiving facility. Um, I had a um, baseball field to the left of the backyard where uh, the parents found the seven-year-old um, child who had drowned, uh, fallen into the um, pool, hit their head and drowned. Uh, we got there, we got pulses back, Ross, they kept going in and out, in and out. Um, for me to travel 45 minutes to a regular tertiary hospital, I felt was um, not in the patient's best interest. So I called in a helicopter, um, and there was only myself and an EMT. Um, at the time, uh, we got Ross back, and as we were loading them up and in, the patient went into arrest again, um, but the crew was fine transporting down to a pediatric specialty center where the child did live for approximately another um, three days, but succumbed to their injuries of the drowning, the hypox injury, injury. so, you know, there, there, there are always, you know, uh, rhymes or reasons on why we do things. 
So if we look at this again, here we can see um, this is a side mount aircraft where you actually put the air, uh, patient in sideways and they have a gimbal in which they rotate around here. So you, here you can see the crew is at the head. Okay, and they come in and this way here you can see this is an EC style uh, Eurocopter design which uh, comes in from the back end. You notice in either of these cases, you cannot reach the patient's feet if you need to. And doing CPR in these um, environments is not um, most beneficial. As well as if you have a patient that is combative or there is any possibility of becoming combative, they need to knock that patient down uh, because you can't have somebody become angry and start swinging at you at 3,000 feet. Benefits, okay, speed decreased out of hospital time, quality of care provided, does provide a higher level of care depending on the service which you're utilizing, um, and rapid access to that specialty care. Limitations, weather, big one. Um, transport may be the only option, okay. Um, it's one of those things expensive um, aircraft maintenance training for the uh, for not only the medical staff but also the pilots 24 7 staffing fuel and insurance please remember that these are faa mandated every hundred hours of flight um, think about it hundred hours of flight that's about two weeks you know if that's you know if you're working a two-week rotation it's 80 hours every hundred hours of flight these aircraft mu must go a hundred hour faa clearance inspection which basically means that every little thing that can wiggle and wobble has to be taken off that aircraft and evaluated and put back. And a hundred hour usually takes about a week to do, hundred hour inspection. After that, based on there's um, 500 an hour and then there's a thousand hour, and basically at a thousand hour of flight time, everything gets pulled off that aircraft and everything gets replaced on that aircraft. Um, so it's very, very, very expensive. Spatial limitations with most small and medium-sized helicopters. Now, the Dauphines, Korskis, those are much, much bigger. Transport one to two patients. When we start getting into the Bells, when we start getting into the EC models, the single models, you can only put one patient in there. And if you get an obese patient, again, depending on what the uh, crew size is, um, depending on what the over um, – flight characteristics are of the aircraft, as well as what the environment is. Um, if it's cold and dry out, you're not gonna get as much lift, whereas if it's warm and humid out, you can get much more lift in a warm, humid day because the air is thicker because of the moisture content versus a cold fall day uh, where there's no humidity. It's much thinner, you can't carry as many people. So if you end up having a crew, the total is less than, you know, you get uh, small individuals that you know, are 130 pounds each, it's 260 pounds, you can carry a much larger patient. Whereas if you end up having, you know, two, um, two um, crews that are 220 pounds, that's 440 pounds. Now, you know, now you have, you have to limit equipment carry, you know, what's your pilot weigh, you know, uh, and how much can you weigh your patient? So those are um, issues. Um, also patients, I believe patients in the old stat medevac ACs, um, you could, I think six foot six was the biggest you could put, put your patient on. So if you had to, showed up on a helicopter, with a helicopter and your patient's over six foot six, they may or may not be able to get in. Um, I only had one uh, one situation where I called in a helicopter. Um, they asked me how much the patient weighed and I told them and they said they couldn't fit them. Um, so this guy ended up having a massively um, needed blood, honestly, in the field, but I was in the middle of nowhere. He had crashed his Harley um, and basically open, um, amputation of his uh, right leg at his uh, femoral head. And, you know, we got him controlled bleeding, but it took us an hour and 20 minutes to get him to a trauma center. Whereas if I could have got a helicopter and if he wasn't over 450 pounds, I could have gotten him there much easier, but you had to do what you had to do. Most, um, most services are going to have three crew. That's going to include the pilot and then your, um, your medical crew. Now, um, as I have listed here, providers are under usually under 220 pounds and under six foot one. Um, that's because of the um, weight abilities and characteristics of the aircraft. Um, that's why typically you will see um, helicopter crews like to hire very short, stocky individuals. 
females. Um, so you'll see that. And it's not, you know, they just need light individuals. 95% of the helicopter services in domestic United States consist of a paramedic and a nurse. Um, and uh, I know in Life Flight, which is one of the first here in Pennsylvania, Life Flight uses PHRNs. In fact, Life Flight out of uh, Allegheny General Hospital was the hospital and the system that um, started the creation of PHRN, pre-hospital RNs, which is only a PA program, uh, but they fly um, two nurses, usually PHRNs, um, because they also have emergency medicine residency. Most of the time, they'll off that um, second PHRN to fly with a, a physician. Stat Medevac typically will fly a um, um, will fly a medic and a PHRN. Um, so, but they can be moved in and out. There are specific crews um, based on the specialty unit, especially pediatric ne neonates and everything else like that. Um, more than likely, you'll never see just a, um, 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 the pilot and a single medical provider. Fixed wings a little bit different, but usually the um, other ones, um, when we end up having a rotary wing, you'll end up seeing two providers and a pilot. All right, and then you'll end up seeing just the physician nurse models usually outside the um, outside the U.S., um, especially in the NHS in the U.K. Um, they usually in their ambulance they'll have a physician and um, a uh, what's comparable to a um, nurse, a PHRN, um, as a medic. Uh, most medics that uh, do function outside of the United States do so with a four years um, bachelor's degree, but those individuals do start at about you know, 60, um, six di digits, about 100,000 a year. Some controversies, we do have um, crashes. We've seen a rash of them, whether that's due to uh, failure in flight um, or anything else like that. S um, some services will continue to fly um, single turbine engines. Problem is when you lose something at 3,000 to 5,000 feet, uh, there is a process called a um, auto rotation where you put the uh, blades into uh, neutral and you can float down. Um, a lot of times those single turbines do have a higher fatality because they don't have any. Uh, once you lose that, once you lose that engine, you lose your lift and your forward mobility. Um, whereas a twin turbine, uh, you'll always have one in backup as well as it gives you more um, weight to um, RPMs to take off with a higher weight. Um, but as well as because we have a lot of helicopters that are very in close, very proximity, um, Medical necessity, as I talked about earlier, it became a business decision most of the time to call on a helicopter. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, as well as Eastern PA, based on population, is highly, highly um, saturated with um, a lot of aircraft. Um, you know, um, where my EMS career, we covered, like I said, Southwestern Pennsylvania. At the time, um, under the Pennsylvania Bureau of EMS, you could not transport across state lines. Um, if you were in Southern Greene County and Ruby, uh, West Virginia University Hospital was literally 20 miles away versus Pittsburgh, which was, you know, 70 miles away, you had to transport to the Pittsburgh Hospital. You weren't permitted to fly across um, the um, border. Um, and then with the panhandle of, you know, Weirton in uh, West Virginia, there's multiple level one trauma centers across that, but we had to stay within the state. One thing that you'll find out too, if you're on the Southern border, uh, most of the time state police of Maryland will not cross the uh, Northern border into Pennsylvania. Very rarely will they do as well as um, if you are east of the Appalachian Ridge, the hospital that they will fly to in Maryland, most of the time all of their patients in the state of Maryland will come back to um, shock trauma in Baltimore. Very rarely, if they are west of the Appalachian Ridge, they'll fly to Ruby in West Virginia. But the majority of those guys where they're at will land, um, come back to um, shock trauma which is really interesting when I learned that one. There is a um, consortium, it's called the Patient First Air Ambulance Alliance, um, and it's a one call system where they try to uh, get everybody to get into that. But again, um, it's a very monetarily driven um, process when we go, go along. But again, one of these ideas behind this consortium is to make sure that that voluntary um, consortium 
they have the the, the uh, air ambulance services have the most up to date technology when it comes to that. Um, one of the thing being enhanced ground proximity warning, um, especially if they're flying IFR um, radar radar altimeters as well as that. But all these tools are there to improve safety, but none of them are mandated by the FAA to be on all of the EMS helicopters. We've all worked for services that you know services just may get by on the bare minimum. Um, but again. Um, you know, how much safety can you build into something based on whether or not you're going to get a what's known as your ROI, return on your investment. Um, but again, the FAA has the exclusive authority to regulate air ambulances. Um, the air ambulances do fall under the authority of the purview of Airline Deregulation Act, and that's back in 1987, 1988, um, and a no single uniformly recognized certifying agency for the air medical industry. But I think this is um, kind of uh, redundant here since you're all competent EMTs. Um, I hope you've called in a helicopter somewhere along the way. Um, but again, um, nowadays we just basically call the PSAP and they'll usually take care of everything, but you need to be aware of what the PSAP is going to need from you. Um, there's also many, many apps. The two that I'm aware of are from AHN, Allegheny Health Network, as well as the UPMC, where if you set it up, you can actually ping your GPS device on your phone and they can land within 30, um, 30 yards of your uh, location, probably even closer now. But again, one of the things that you're going to need is an overall GPS coordinates is the best thing. This is where, you know, just having somebody land at the corner of uh, Maine and Winslow may not be beneficial because they don't know where they're going. Um, that's where GPS coordinates do come in. Um, giving them cross streets, roads, what's the closest city town, knowing your area. An actual location um, of the actual address is a one thing or well-known landmarks is also. But again, PSAP, following your protocols and everything else like that is what you need um, to help follow that along. Please remember that calling, if you do need a helicopter, calling early, especially if there's no aircraft in the vicinity currently unloaded, flying about is the best um, is the best way to get a hold of them. Um, you know, it takes about 20 minutes to do a flight check to make sure you're able to fly, um, that they're willing to fly um, with that based on everything. You know, your typical, you know, this is what we need. This is what we'd like. Can you do that? Uh, most of the time we're not landing them. It's some type of um, fire department and or secondary EMS service uh, that'll come in and handle it for you. But if, again, you need to know what, um, you know, um, frequency they're working at. Most aircrafts have your frequency built in. It's not like you have to get a special PL or private lock um, to get into that. Um, but again, as part of the whole NIM structure, um, you should have an under ICS. LZ officer should be able to come in, helicopter, um, if you're landing something, you should have a um, fire department there to be able to have some type of fire suppression um, with that. Um, these individuals, and again, pre-marked pre LZs are wonderful. You don't want to land somebody in that's got, you know, into a landfill because these aircraft are bringing in a lot of downwind, which will flow things up. You get a larger Dauphin or a sea or a Coast Guard or something like that, you pull too close, these things can't put enough downdraft in to flip small vehicles over. All right. ATC air to ground communications with aircraft. You got to know where they're coming from. The pilot needs to know, as well as you got to protect them. They got to know if there's any uh, overhead issues. Uh, you got to watch for individuals flashing up lasers. If it's a night vision, you've all seen the videos for that. You can Google that. Um, but also getting an ETA and a real quick rundown for the crews, uh, what they're coming into. Uh, because it's like an ambulance showing up on scene. The more pre arrival information you can give them, the much better off for them. Um, ideally, your LZ should be 100 by 100, a little if any slope, okay? I mean, because the pilot can't really tell without any um, without any um, ground markers or anything what what it looks like. You don't want somebody landing on a uh, landing on a list. Dusty, uh, you want to avoid dust because again, all that stuff's going to lift up pretty pretty quick. Um, Never have your um, hose charged at the aircraft in, in case something um, were to open up or the hose were to break open. You don't want that flowing into rotor wash. And, you know when that when that thing's going at seven to eight thousand uh, RPMs a minute. Okay, um, knowing which way the wind's traveling, that's going to be a pilot thing. We're not going to have wind socks up for that. Um, but again, if you're able to, that's wonderful. 
Uh, mark your LZ with cones usually um, by day and strobes at night. Um, the problem with um, cones, if they're not weighted down, is they will be blown away secondary to the rotor wash. Um, a, a easy way to get cheap ones is go to um, Harbor Freight, buy some of the um, cheap uh, lanterns that take the big nine volt batteries, vertical in that, put a two by four underneath it to hold it down then have those shine straight up. That will illuminate your um, cone, uh, but you don't want to use flares. Those things can blow away all that other stuff. You don't want to use white lights either. You want to kind of go with a red because green and blue, they're very hard to see over, uh, over, um, over the night sky, avoid shining any lights, including your headlights, your scene lights, your emergency lights. Um, red lights are okay, but once you start getting into those white ones, it becomes problematic because, you know, if it's at night, uh, daylight's not that big of an issue, but if it's at night, uh, your pilot's going to have night vision goggles on them. You don't want to blind them. Um, no lasers um, because they bounce around and it can, um, Line them. Please remember, even your you know two dollar uh, cat laser that you use can travel um, indefinitely in the night sky. So please be mindful. Uh, strobes, as we talked about, red and white strobes are easy to see with night vision goggles, but it also blinds them. The flares we've already talked about. Remember um, the, the the critical time coming in and taking off. You don't want to have too many bystanders. The roto wash will throw things, as well as you will get um, individuals with um, taking pictures, taking um, flashes during the night will blind your pilot. Be mindful. Um, keep everybody clear. But again, knowing what vertical aspects um, of the LZ around people are very 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 important. Uh, somebody came up with this um, acronym called Hot Saw. When you're setting up an LZ, hazards, any hazards that the pilot should be aware of, any obstructions they should be aware of, any terrain um, issues. What type of surface are they going to land on? Is it going to be soft ground? Is it going to be hard pack? Is it going to be carpet? Um, not carpeting. Um, or, yeah, it could be carpeting if they're landing in a um, – baseball field or something like that. Um, could it be uh, soft grass or something like that? Any surface, um, any animals? Is it a wild area? Possibility of dogs, cats, um, squ you know, squirrels or anything else like that jutting in front of you and any wind and, and or weather uh, patterns that are coming up, which they should know of because most, most helicopters nowadays do have glass cockpits um, and they do have forward looking radar based on uh, the weather patterns. Um, helicopters are always going to come in, try to come in with the wind in, um, on the front of the aircraft provides more lift, um, but also know which way, um, the, the, the compass is going on your LZ, um, and always use reference to the pilot's, um, coordinate system, you know, north, south, east, and west. If you don't know which way you're going, uh, give them a reference. Hey, do you see my engine? Do you see my helicopter? Okay. From that point, if you look towards the front of my, it's going to be 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, something like that. Try to figure out um, where the pilot is sitting and uh, use that as a definition, okay? Night vision, again, we've talked about already. Uh, crew may request scene lights being turned off during their final approach. Most helicopter services that I'm aware will do a uh, flyby and then they'll come around and circle at least twice before they uh, before they land because um, not only will the um, pilot have eyes upon the LZ, but also the crew members in the back, usually they'll alternate. One's on the pilot's left, one's on the pilot right, and they'll call out just like if you're sitting in the front seat. Hey, it's clear to the right. Here they come or something like that. So please be mindful. Um, crews should be able to hear them when they're coming in. Um, your PSAP or incident coordinator should designate your overall radio frequency, limit radio chatter. Um, as you're coming in on that, um, even though you can see the aircraft, they may not be able to see you due to flares um, or uh, sunlight based on where you're at. Use clock-based directional as we talked about landing. If anybody sees it, see something, say something, abort landing. Um, these guys are mostly military or state police. Um, they've had a ton, a ton of if they hear the word abort, they're just going to power up and pull right back out. Um, 
So as well as once the aircraft is has landed, never approach the aircraft without getting direct instructions from the pilot and or a crew member that is uh, removed themselves from the fuselage. Uh, you don't want to be walking around this thing. Um, this thing's going around seven to ten thousand RPMs. Uh, it'll take your head off quicker than anything. Um, one thing you do want to be mindful of is the tail rotor. Um, your uh, pilot may or may not leave the helicopter running. Um, there's a lot, there's a big difference between something that is just um, running or idling versus takeoff speed. Um, you'll definitely hear it as well as you'll hear, hear the camber of the wing changing. Um, but the one thing you want to be mindful of is the tail rotor. Um, in the um, older systems, the EC models where you end up getting a rear entry uh, of the device. It's very, very interesting. They have protecting things there, but this tail rotor is moving at, uh, if not greater than your traditional uh, main rotor. Um, this stops it from moving left to right around the gyroscopic center of this main rotor. Um, there's nothing to say that you just can't walk into this silly thing. And this thing, depending, this aircraft here, this is sitting as this extends out, probably comes within four and a half to five feet of um, the ground. So be mindful, but this is a traditional style. Um, if you end up with a hot load, you want to avoid that at all costs. When you approach this vehicle, this aircraft, you want to approach it from the front to where everybody can see you. Um, this is a combined system here where we have a protective system. Uh, you still don't want to be throwing anything in, in there like a Ginsu knife, but this protects you just the same, but this rotates around. And in this system here was something that came out in the uh, mid nineties is called a dotar system, no tail rotor. This is what I was talking about before. This is an enclosed engine system where instead of the exhausts coming out in the um, tailpipes here, this goes straight out. And then this has an exhaust port on this and you're able to, um, just like the tail rotor down here on the collective, you're able to rotate around utilizing um, that using the exhaust. So as I said, we're only going to um, approach the, the aircraft from the front and direct view of the flight crew. Always approach from downhill side, walk away from the aircraft in the same direction from which you approached it. Never turn your back on the aircraft either until you're at least, at least outside of the uh, rotors. Please be mindful that as these rotors are spinning, the faster they're spinning, the further up they will go. As you, as that um, rotor start to dip, um, slow down, they dip. Therefore, they'll get closer to the ground. This was always um, a bigger danger with the older Hueys, which had the very, very long, thick, heavy um, rotors. They would dip almost you know, like four feet off until they got up to speed and then they were above the aircraft. That's where the smaller aircraft that have more blades and they're shorter, they took that, sa that, they, that created a, uh, a safer aircraft. Um, and then honestly, don't touch anything. Um, because again, is flight worthiness. If you don't know um, whether or not you should pull or push on a latch, you can actually break it. Um, these, these areas right here, even if you just come in, this is very thin plexiglass. Uh, you can put your foot through one of these, even, um, even if you're just trying to help somebody, you throw something in there or whatnot, and it falls and it cracks this, you know, windscreen or something like that, uh, that grounds the aircraft. Now you can't fly. Um, so it, it we were, um, a couple of years ago, um, Life Flight had a um, big thing is um, golf outings. They flew a helicopter in so everybody could tour it. Um, somebody hit a wayward drive, took out the windscreen. They had to bring in a, uh, a mechanic with a new windscreen and get that fixed before that aircraft could fly. Even though it was just a little ding in there, um, it did not meet uh, FAA flight worthiness standards, which became problematic. Um, and again, depending on how these aircraft open up and you put your uh, patient in, each one of these have different loading patterns. 
most, if they are side, they will load on the same side as the pilot. Um, some of these, um, like your um, EC models here, these are rear entry, so they load head first. When we, and again, here's one from the side, and then here's one from the rear, showing a little bit better as they go in. But in this aircraft here, here you can see the, pa the, the patients, this is a much shorter bodied fuselage, but again, notice here, okay, directly to the left of the um, pilot, this pilot sits on the right side of the aircraft. This one here is the left side, but notice here's where the patient's feet sit um, with that. So here's the collective, there's the uh, rudder and all that other stuff. Here's, the, here's, you know, down here in the center is all of the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't turn this on. Uh, but he, down here, this is your forward-looking radar. Here's your altimeters and your gyroscopes tell you whether you're flying flat or not. But here you can see the patient's feet fit in this area right here. Over here um, is over on this side. Um, this is just, again, approaching uh, your aircraft should be either from the pilot's direct view. You want to avoid anything here. Remember, if you can't see the pilot, the pilot can't see you. Right. Hand off, you know, simple demist report, knowing everything else like that, um, where you're going to end up getting a handoff most of the time. The aircraft crew will come into your ambulance, uh, do a full secondary assessment, get what information they need. If they need if patients combative, they'll RSI them and they will intubate them uh, because they don't want the patient coming, um, coming together. Um, uh, coming awake in their in their air ambulance and uh, beating the crap out of anybody, um, so they'll come and they'll, they'll come to you. Um, brief, concise report: meds dose administered. If you've given everything, um, get patient's identification, vital signs, and other um, assessment stuff that you did. Um, also, please remember if the patient is conscious, alert, and oriented, uh, they have a right to determine the receiving facility based on the overall needs. Um, so if you need, if they're going to a level one somewhere, uh, they want to go to XYZ versus one, two, three, they have that right. And the air ambulance has to, um, or should, um, try to adhere to the patient's wishes with that. Um, also, if the patient says, no, I don't want to go, and you've tried everything and you have to deliver them by ground, you may have to deliver by, gr by ground. Um, and this is very important to know where the patient goes. That way you can report it to family, to the PD, whoever else, as well as to put it to the EPCR. Um, there's nothing, nothing worse for the receiving facility for somebody to show up at one facility thinking that they were transported there and they go to another facility. Um, that's, a pro that's a problem that we run into still to this day in Western PA with the dueling air, air ambulance services. Hey, they need to go to a XYZ. Okay, they take off, the patient becomes intubated. Oh, we went to one, two, three. But when you're in the air and you have three level one trauma centers within five nautical miles, flying five nautical miles at about 200 miles an hour takes less than 30 seconds. So it, it becomes problematic at that point. Loading them, assist the crews. Okay, follow their rule of thumb. Make sure your aircraft's at least 25 to 50 feet away from your landing zone um, because of the rotor wash. Um, and then let them take off. You, you don't need to um, help them with that, but um, keep all your crew away. Everything else like that, don't look directly at it. Um, getting hit in the middle of the head with a uh, piece of rock or something isn't, uh, per, isn't very cool. Look, help them out. Look for any um, open doors, compartments. All right. If you see anything, say something, um, you know, tell the LZ or something like that, you know, uh, commander, hey, this is there, this came up, you know, somebody showed up in a car after they landed, I was unaware, or something like that, let them know. But again, they are modern uh, use in EMS uh, policy. Your procedures will dictate your patient care, uh, will dictate whether or not you utilize them with them, but uh, you may never call. You may never have to. You may work in a facility doing IFTs. You may end up working um, in the city and may never end up using one. But know that they are up there. And honestly, even across the state, I can't tell you how many helicopter services there are. Um, I can tell you what I'm familiar with. But everybody has their own policies and procedures on how to use them. But it's something, it's, it's a tool in your toolkit. All right.
Anybody have any questions, concerns, anything like that? One second here. Anything? No, oh, that's here. Okay. Brandon, nope. Okay, so uh, the one thing I do need is I, ne I sent out a secondary email. I'm going to be at my computer tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and I have at least, you know, a bunch of people that need to go over their um, – um, need to go over their um, papers with me. So uh, team two is Maria and Victoria. You guys are scheduled normally for lab on Thursday. I would expect to hear something from you so I could send you a, uh, a um, go to meeting so we could uh, work on that. Um, Sam B and Brandon, you guys are a mixed group. Sam, you had a Tuesday lab. Brandon, you had a Thursday lab. You guys can pick or choose Tuesday or Thursday. Okay, I saw that, Brandon. I sent an email. Okay, great. I've been in my email during lecture. Um, Lorenzo and uh, Suspenders, you guys are Tuesday and Thursday, so uh, let me know. Uh, Sean and Mort, Tuesday, so you um, – Tuesdays, um, Sean and Mort, you're going to have to get something together um, for tomorrow. And RJ and Ramey, same thing um, for tomorrow. So please get those to me as quickly as possible. And it's first come, first served. All right. If nobody um, has any questions or uh, anything on Wednesday, um, we're supposed to do ground operations. And um, I'll continue on with geriatrics. More than likely, we'll probably do ground ops. And then we'll do geriatrics after that. Um, but if nobody has any questions, I'm done, and I will see everybody uh, tomorrow or uh, at the next earliest Wednesday. Everybody get a, have a good week, and like I said, it will take me about 8, 16 hours to get this uploaded. I'll talk to everybody later.